tonight is like Web3 is such a broad topic. So let's uh, break it down. So maybe uh, I know one use of AI is to is to summarize large streams of data. So how would that be used in maybe specifically to write reports end of quarter or even end of week reports to a donor uh, about whatever you want to email them? How would you use AI to actually uh, actually help them understand where the money is going? Yeah, for sure. So being a software engineer, for me personally, I haven't really emailed in three years. You know, I've been using you know these type of tools for the last three years. So from a reporting standpoint, you know, we're we're approaching a place right now where you can pull from all different sources, you know, and have it all, you know, communicate with, you know, um, you know, the chat or the English models that we have for it. So for example, you know, you can you know, you can have an Excel of like your numbers. You know, you can have uh, documents and templates and then how you want to write it. You know, and then you can have, you know, an agent or you know, it's your AI agent where kind of like combines all these things together, you know, and it writes it out. You know, so I think that's one of the biggest the main areas that we're we'll seeing change of our intelligence is we're seeing three main areas, which is the agent, the user, you know, and then you know, kind of like the uh, like the uh, like the business, so like you know, the chat GPTs, your your uh, state of fusion. So combining those three, you know, and like assigning it on board, you know, to kind of do what you want to do, anything from from reports to emails, you know, to you know, uh, helping rewrite your marketing, you know, business content, blogs, you know, all of your data. It's where we're just seeing a revolution change. But in the ideal user, would these be power users, and basically like uh, regular like, uh, data scientists or programmers, or data scientists today? How do you uh, to see that happening in a year from now? Yeah, I think today we're we're very much at a place where we can use a lot of drop, like drag and drop tools. So there's like a platform. Called um, Lake Flow, you know, that a lot of people can use who don't know how to code. Um, so basically, what you can do with that, you can, you know, upload like your documents, your PDFs, you know, so they're your choice. And then connect that, you know, to a platform like OpenAI, where you can write comments and edits, you know, to ask questions, get your own, you know, data. Um, a year from now, I think we would be. There plus plus, and I think we'll be I think we'll be approaching the place and thing where you know your day to day user will be able to you know kind of you know log into the platform, upload their information, you know, and then have the right prompts or have an AI agent to do continuous you know action stuff from there. Um, it's interesting too as well because the the world of software engineering is changing. Is not even moved, you know, it's so it's evolving. And I think what's going to happen is not only with my role, but other people's role, I think we're approaching a world where every position, every individual is going to have an AI assistant to some degree. Interesting. Well, I know you have some experience in the web the world. Um, how do you think Web3 and AI can be combined in the non blocking space? Is it all? Yeah, I, one of the things I've been spending a lot of time on is lately we've been very, we've been very, very good at building software before it's great. You know, and so, you know, for example, with Web3, smart contracts is one of those things. That we built it before the new rate, you know, so they can be anywhere from business ready to consumer, you know, consumer ready, whatever it may be. Um, but something like that, you know, using that type of like superpower, you know, to now offer and everything for anything from closing out contracts and everything for video space, you know, to you know, big donors and everything, monthly donors, monthly donors, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, it gives them a, a superpower that we didn't have. You know, to do so, you know, for so that's just one example. 
of the population of all this. You know, it's interesting, like, you know, when I mentioned Web3, I assumed you were going to talk about NFTs, but you're actually, like, going very software engineering and going to smart contracts, you actually work at concepts. So, so let's, uh, let's start in the smart contracts. So, I know a lot of uh, impact investors or even passion investors, they actually want to see firsthand what their money is going to. So, how can a smart contract be used to actually verify or actually help uh, help the uh, impact investors actually uh, verify that the money is actually used properly. Yeah, definitely. Well, so a smart contract basically is a is a, a, soft, a software uh, contract kind of thing that you kind of you know put into a uh, you know a blockchain or something like that. And so from there, we should be given specific instructions on how you want to execute over time. You know, so going back to your question, so there, this gives the donor, the sponsor, the company, the contract, the ability to almost like watch their money and you know, track their money, like where it's going. You know, so, you know, if you, if you donate some money and you say, hey, I'm donating my money to a great organization, and I would like my money to go help build a new facility, you can watch that money so as a new track. And then also, too, you know, for the organization, they can come back and ask for uh, the permission to maybe transition to that money to, you know, help, you know, with uh, finding cure for new disease, where it would be. You know, so basically, all this means it was simply transparency. You know, and so that's what smart contracts, you know, things like the blockchain and stuff do. It allows you to see transparently where your money is going, you know, how it's being you know, over you know amount of time. We're not talking about just days. You know, we talk about you know, you watch money. You know, for this is months to years. You know, as well. So you know, now I'm just Marlon Avery. Uh, AI yeah, Impact. We are uh, doing some workshops to organizations, individuals, and governments. So kind of like helping um, you know the scares of you know, what AI is, can be, and will be. Kind of help people bridge the gaps. So I was mentioning to Marlon earlier today that uh, you know I, I I see his name all over all over town. He's like prolific. Quickly uh, become became a very uh, noticeable AI influencer in the community. So Marlon, uh, what have you been doing for the audience in the AI education uh, sphere? Yeah, for sure. So I'm a software engineer at our uh, problem solving championship. Um, so so. The quickest thing is about figuring out. I worked at a venture capital firm um, by the name of Venture Capital. And while I was there, they had a venture side and they had a nonprofit side too as well. And so the leadership came to me and said, Hey, on the nonprofit side, we have to raise money with a raise capital. And the way we do that is grants. And so um, they said, Hey, can you help us figure out a way to speak this process so, up? And so um, we had just got access to open AI. And so I was like, all right, we're going to dive into this and figure it out. And so, and so the leadership of us said, hey, don't expect to die for like six months. <laughs> you know, let me kind of figure these things out. I figured it out in two weeks. And so we, got, so we ended up, we ended up building this an AI crank writer. Uh, and that's when I got first came and I got like, you know, kind of got me blown and stuff. And I had the mayor. And so, you know, shortly after my tenure there, I was like, hey, I got you back into the last two minutes. So, uh, under the heading of Great Minds and the Light, there was an event just uh, an hour ago with uh, MetaDAO, and their concept is using AI for uh, nonprofits like, to actually help them with their, you know, their uh, back office brand writing as well. So, this seems to be a uh, great concept. So, what is it about nonprofits and AI that makes them such a great fit? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a, I think now, I think you think about now parts because they're a typically an organization who has other resources. And you're seeing artificial intelligence as a platform where you kind of have to close some of those gaps. You know, so the KC company just did a research paper uh, a few weeks ago, and they said that generative AI is going to add anywhere from like 2.2 trillion to 4.4 trillion dollars to the economy. And it's not all the four categories, which is uh, customer operations, um, research and development, software engineering, 
um, you know, in your report. Uh, so the, those opportunities typically, you see our big companies, they quickly integrate. You know, they have the resources and the money that comes in behind it. But with nonprofits, you know, they can definitely take advantage of this as well. They just need that with a post generation. So that, let, let's try to dive deeper into that. So, you know, traditionally, when it seems like when nonprofits use technology, you know, the, the sales pitch by the software companies is you're going to reduce, reduce your overhead, reduce your expenses. But I can definitely see how this statute will increase their, their donors because the donors can see that, that you know, all the employees, if 80% of employees are no longer just fine doing back office work, I should be able to do what the nonprofit is supposed to be doing. And somehow donors can be actually more, more motivated to support the nonprofit. But how are you seeing AI being used um, actually in the real world for nonprofits? Yeah, uh, one of the examples, so I, you know, software engineer, I built an AI email uh, a few months ago. And so what it does is, you know, once I get an email in, um, I pull it to my AI this is the email, it grabs the response and gives it back to me. So I'm just kind of sick of it. You know, so one, we're talking about speed. The second aspect of what we look at around this book is case personalization. You know, so the ability to be able to get an email, to tailor each email to that owner or to that sponsor will be changed forever. You know, so for example, say for example, you have a thousand different owners. You find out of those thousand, say five or nine or off of the social channel, now you can use AI to see if that 75 donors consistent emails by the way at the end of every email and a a well-known Boston Celtics fun fact. Just to add the human touch, you know, and so the personalization component, you know, this it changes everything for that. Yeah, actually that, that that's amazing. You know, you can probably do it in uh, real time you know, when the game just ended. So, um, just uh, switching tracks a little bit in large mountains of data, and you mentioned some other new technologies, including AI agents. So, maybe put on your uh, your sci-fi or, or future futurism hat. Not even like far enough, just near the future. Like, give you an example. Like, you know, the first dot-com bubble, people predicted a lot of like really cool things, and it actually happened. You know, not, you know maybe not right away, but it did happen. So. Maybe define some terms of what's the AI agent or other cool things now, and uh, and how do you foresee these technologies being used in the real world in the near future? So I guess we have some slides coming up here. So like all these tools now are built on the big models. You know, so a lot of the models basically is like a consortium of text. You know, so this started, you know, some time ago with Google. You know, they didn't research their name, but everything kind of changed with Google in 2017, you know, when they started like Transformers, you know, which is the ability, you know, to read text faster, you know, in different ways. And so from there, Everything's probably changing because now with these things, we focus on three things, which is system, user, and system internet. And so what I mentioned is like having the ability to then everyone going to have their own AI system, you know, the system's are already being defined. You know, with this percent, we're seeing this by second of users or open AI or everything. The user is us. And this is what makes it endless because I can read a paper. You can read a paper. Everyone has two totally different approaches, you know, to how we want to go and facilitate the information, which now makes that possibility in this program. And then the assistant of the system will change everything because now you can say, hey, you know, I want you to act as a market professional and do X. I want you to act as a software engineer and do Y. I want you to act as a sales coach and teach you this. You know, so these these three these three things, this right here will make it endless and this right here was gonna like shift every almost every position, you know, from bartender, you know, to a cook, you know, how it was for you. 
so the assistant aspect is really interesting because I think, you know, if you are in the a creative, like, you know, a writer, I call this about writing prompts when you're in a writing workshop. But now, adding that to the technology world, it, it seems like uh, the creativity aspect of the world is is becoming like mainstream in engineering as well. So let's talk about that. Like, so say say I'm a a uh, director, and and I want to talk to a potential donor, and also talk to a potential recipient. How would I use viewpoints uh, to uh, improve outcomes? So some of the things we do now, we go gather information. You know, so we go gather information about, you know, the individual. So we see that you know, he's a dial of Austin, you know, where's Austin, you know. Uh, you know, he enjoys, he focuses on areas where he enjoys uh, both the imagery around uh, students learning STEM. You know, and everything. So, like, literally, once we gather all this information, we can just use a tool like ChatGPT and everything. Kind of like feed the problems. Like, hey, I'm writing an email to Bob, the donor. Um, he's a diehard of Austin Red Scouts fan, but focuses on STEM. And then from there, when well, you being a user, you put in your information of how you want to communicate, you know, and just get in there. I mean, the beautiful thing now is the large English models. As it was training these models, we knew that it was going to understand uh, text. Like, we, we figured that out. We knew it was going to understand words. But the thing that was very surprising to all of us is that we didn't know we were going to understand the writing principles. You know, so just giving it, you know, blocks of text, you know, it still can come out with a little uh, uh, that's amazing. So, or maybe this is more of a thought experiment. Uh, you know, the thing about WordPress, obviously, or all other ecosystems, is they're enclosed ecosystems. So, you know, they, they have their ways of doing things, but we can give them a hint of what the overall strategy would be. Yeah. So, are you, you want not to answer, or do you want, like, like, like I need a person who's going to figure this out? Well, maybe let's start with the, uh, the OG developer, and then let's go to the, uh, maybe the, uh, the actual, uh, uh, the person who is the content creator. Okay. Who's using the widgets. So, OAI allows, uh, individuals to, uh, create pages, you know, which basically a, uh, a piece of tech or a piece of software that, you know, can help you kind of do X, Y, and Z kind of stuff. So, so it's for AI, which is, um, from uh, OpenAI as opposed to the widgets for WordPress, two separate concepts or the same? Yeah, so you got, so on so the consumer side, you have ChatGPT, and then ChatGPT allows you to create widgets, everything. So what you do is, this is basically communicators, you know, so ChatGPT is like the middle person. The software team is creating the widget and then the product bringing up the widget to communicate to So you have your WordPress site, Create a WordPress widget, and you say, "Hey, I want to share to communicate to the background like and you know, down talk back and forth with what's going on with stuff." And so, there, what you can do it is you can say, "Hey, this is my website, you know, with WordPress, and I don't understand how to edit, change, add, subtract, what it can be." And so. From that standpoint, you really can have it where it can possibly be like a URL and say, hey, I need to update this website, give me the stuff, walk me through it, and have to do the stuff. So that's actually brilliant. You know, I, I, which could be a whole business. Yeah, I okay. think like in your, uh, maybe we talk about your background, uh, but yeah. the data pool there, people like rather than going like uh, top down, starting with, uh, Open AI chat GPT and started from, from the actual uh, platform that the, the business owner or nonprofit owner is already familiar with. So I can definitely see that's a better world, real world use case rather than like more theoretical white paper. Right? So let's go quickly into your background. Uh, how do you come up with these cool concepts and uh, what you do to AI now? You're bored. 
I'm a software engineer, so I'm a software engineer, and it's a lot harder. Um, you know, so, but I, like, Jupiter or AI was really kind of taught me by the way. I just haven't been able to, like, let it go. It's so big that, you know, I do any of you, like, we do some workshops to help the community, uh, you know, organizations and developments, you know, help you know, everybody figure this out. So, I mean, honestly, on this, uh, adding, Four point four trillion dollars to the economy um, is great, but also too, there's a lot of individuals who really take advantage of this world. And so, teaching them as well, you know, how to take advantage of this. That's what, like people said, you know, creating a a WordPress feature in order to be a whole business structure. Um, so from there, you know, I just play basically how to show days for me. I build custom solutions myself. How these things can work. So I rebuilt the grant writer. Uh, I built a custom curriculum, um, a curriculum on designer for teachers. You know, so basically, we have 32 students go in a class. Of those 32, a bunch of learning style. I guess that's you put a student's name in and a learning style. You still know each student. You know, one curriculum, one subject, you can create 30 different pieces of content, 30 different Google assignments, 30 different. He was all up on the which makes, you know, her case is not often the case. So these customers are going to go into all the time. You know, we want to teach ourselves to kind of better and stuff like that, but also to help the community as well. Interesting. And what drew you to the impact area? Um, you know, a typical use case of new new technology is, is to do a startup. What drew you to impact instead? Um, to streamline and modernize your communications with and, uh, with your stakeholders. Now, how would you use large language models to actually help with your day to day operations in a generic uh, nonprofit? Well, you have a slide for everything. <laughs> So I wonder if you're, your AI is creating these slides on the fly because I'm not just asked. No, so again, this goes for our businesses, this goes for nonprofits and everything. So like I said, Casey did this report um, some time ago and he said, you know, these things are all 75% of um, you know, the screen that we have in the following four categories. You know, which is custom operations, so if you think about this, is you know, customer bots, AI um, interactions like we were talking about. You know, marketing and sales, you know, this change of things as well. So awareness, conversion, retention, you know, stuff we generally talk about and then R and D too as well. You know, so this is for any company. You know, so now we give somebody who just is a sales and they need to update, you know, their website that lives on WordPress. Literally you can just copy a lot of this code. Ask ChatGPT, explain this to me, and they can start walking you through of how to edit, update, you know, so in a lot of areas like this, you know, you don't need, you know, your day to day professional in some of these areas. Some areas are still do, but this poses a gap in almost everything. That's interesting. So let's start diving number three. So we're pairing daily, like you announced to us, like, like Basically, cloud, cloud software providers like adding AI to their platform. So, say you mentioned WordPress, for example. Say I had a WordPress site like so many of us do. How would I add AI to my current IT infrastructure without doing a whole brick or place or doing something I might not understand? Yeah, it's still challenging, especially with a platform like WordPress. WordPress is designed for you to stay with it. <laughs> you know, it's not designed to make export anything like that. So it's not going to be stable. But I again, mean, it gives you the ability to get an understanding of what's going on. So typically, anybody, you know, who's just a, you know, day to day worker, they just try to understand some of the code. You know? And also, too, we also be on a lot of time as well. Everybody has a good really understanding already of what the world press is. Because they've already scraped the internet, like the platform on the AI. They've already scraped the internet, so they already have a like, story of information already. So you start asking the simple questions, you can give it a role like, hey, I'm a newbie, I don't understand WordPress. Walk me through step by step of how to edit, you know, my own page, 
you know, on the caps and where we can. Great. So uh, before you move on, let's stop uh, this. Uh, Daniel's got a Yeah, I mean, everything is well for me. I think mostly because typically we see big businesses, you know, are building, using, sometimes teaching and stuff like, you know, how these two can work and how it can impact and stuff your life and everything. So something like blockchain, you know, we saw a lot of infrastructure around, but most of kind of how we kind of behind closed doors. Um, but here, this is a tool that is going to impact you some way in some matter, you know. And so I'm just doing my part to make sure, you know, the community and people and stuff that are educated and stuff with it, um, you know, and helping kind of like bridge the gap, you know, for um, consumption, you know, and to involve and stuff. You're welcome to introduce yourself or or not. But, um, do you do you envision um, Nvidia to take to take all the business from the service? Of course, you can. Do you envision Nvidia to take all the business to check from the service? So, I mean, Nvidia will take all the business. I mean, they're currently they're currently they're, they're currently the only company you know, to do the chip for the service that they are. So do you believe NVIDIA chips will be taking over this domain? Yeah. I think it has already. Um, so yeah, so NVIDIA, um, yeah, so I think NVIDIA has really kind of like dominated the market and stuff already because now we start to see Intel, this is one other company to start to make chips as well. But I think for, I think they're going to dominate from, you know, moving forward. They already have it. You know, kind of like about, oh, and any of the companies stuff getting involved and stuff now, you know, you're going to have to like prove that it works and stuff that it's efficient and everything, so everything. And also, too, in video, they have a close relationship with OpenAI. They have a close relationship with Google, Microsoft, you know, and stuff. And so it's not just like my building the product or the solution. It's about those relationship factors as well. And they have both already. Yeah, I know Amazon uh, did an announcement with their partnership with Anthropic yesterday. It wasn't clear, they said they're going to use the Amazon infrastructure. It wasn't yeah. clear if that's chips, but they will follow. Um, they, they, all, the, all the tech companies, big tech companies are American companies, right? So do you say also the, um, your, 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 your printers and future printers, do you think they're going to like, you know, obviously, they all US companies, right? And they're all US companies, they all use Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Qualcomm, they're all US companies. You, so if you kind of think like, so how do you think it's like China? How do you think the um, NVIDIA really won't be allowed to go to China? Well, the concept of the European, the US government won't allow NVIDIA to sell chips, chips to sell, they chip to China. Yeah, so I, I think to summarize the uh, question is, so many of these uh, companies that are in the AI space are American companies. How is it going to affect the rest of the world since American, the American government would not allow China or Chinese companies to use the technology? They would. They would. Yeah. They would. But, they but would. just to your premise also is, you know, there are a lot of companies outside of the United States also, like OpenAI, a lot of core developers are actually in Cambridge and UK. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to impact it. I just think, I just think, I just think, I just think it's going to be biased. It's going to be, it's going to be, but it's going to be, it's going to be biased. It's going to be like these things developed by the US. It's, it's the whole thing is going to be biased. You know, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be biased. It's going to be like yeah, I, I can. Yeah, it's more like a national security. Uh, I, I probably, we're probably not going to be able to answer that tonight. It's probably a good thing. But, but to go on to another point, which is related, uh, earlier we talked about um, there's a shortage of these chips and GPUs. And you were, you were talking about earlier about repurposing GPUs from other industries like gaming, crypto, for, for what? Yeah, so one of the big things I've been spending a lot of time on is, you know, there's a lot of GPUs and stuff that we see with like crypto mining, you know, gaming, or things like that. And so a lot of GPUs are currently out there, but not being used heavily like in this space. Just like having 
a very, very like open experience. And so, so like, it's one of the things I've been like kind of spending a lot of time on is like basically how do we, you know, go gather a lot of GPUs so it's not being used. Typically, they have like small memory, so they kind of kind of create some barriers up there. But it's interesting to the world because now they're starting to see, you know, these large English models or things of their size come down to like smaller sizes as well. And so, you know, maybe in six months, then it could probably you know, maybe not uh, maybe maybe it's not a really good issue. Um, but I think right now, I think a lot of people are trying to figure it out of like how do we kind of use a lot of the GPU stuff that's on the market, that's being used for other things, kind of gather them up to like use to make like AI talk. Yeah, and then as developers on their CDs who might have an issue, like we see this in the uh, game world right now where so much of the technology we used just two years ago had been ripped because the the tech companies have stopped supporting their own hardware and that's literally just two years old. So maybe there's a use case of us being able to develop locally on local laptops without the cloud for sure. Just to throw some problem books on Obviously, the U.S. has the like, U.S. your satellites, Russia has their satellites. The European Union said, you know what? They didn't want to use American satellites. They put their own, they made, put big funding to put their own satellites up. The EU has their own satellites now. So, the fact that all these, all these, you know, the EU one that are using their own satellites for their business, how's that going to affect your tech companies in the U.S.? Who's going to be busy in the AI space? Yeah, uh, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, as far as like the uh, national security implications, uh, I, I'm not sure if we're really uh, able to answer that. Uh, long try to Yeah, I think it's a time to, I mean, we see the European AI, you know, I think that's going to come pretty soon. Uh, probably going to see that more so after the, uh, after the elections, because we'll start to see like the impact of how gender they have to be used for like maybe not so good things. I mean, I think after that, we'll see like more so like policies and governments and stuff gets involved. Um, but we fuss you with Facebook and we fuss you with uh, finding, finding Facebook to boot you, you know, just doing irregularities, you know, saying that Facebook can't link up Facebook and WhatsApp. They said you can't, Mark Zuckerberg wanted to link up WhatsApp and Facebook. He said, no way. No way, you can't put those two days into it. No way. So I'll make you a promise that we actually have, over the next three months, a lot of AI talks coming up. And we'll add an AI national security uh, panel to one of our sessions, and I'll give you a personal invite. Good. Yeah, I think uh, well, we'll watch you find some local experts. You know, there is a U.S. Southern Command, a U.S. Central Command in Florida. We probably should just find someone that's doing this research rather than just us guessing right now. I have a couple okay, of questions. It's a great question, though. So we'll follow up with your information. I have a couple of friends there. Okay, right. so uh, our, 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 our host, our yeah, hostess in the evening behind the camera has some questions, so. Yeah. I can help you with getting some of the speakers for that whole question. Okay, great. <laughs> so I uh, want we'll, 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 we'll to. Uh, uh, I do have a question though, yeah. Okay, last question, then you can have the final word. Marlon, thank you so much for coming in the very last moment. So, amazing speaker. Golda, you have a wonderful gem over here, including Prava, obviously, everybody knows Prava, and now Marlon also, everybody knows. Uh, my question to world and Web3 scams, this, that, and you can just not do a word. Friend of mine, last 40k in Camden. So he's like, Web3 is dead. Is it really dead? So, so the question I is... I think can answer this too. Yeah, so the question is, with all the scams and everything that so we see in Web3, people are a lot, less than a lot of money. And so a lot of people are saying, like, you know, a lot of these things stuff is dead. I don't think it's dead. I think it did the necessary thing it was supposed to do, because I think a lot of greed kind of got embedded into it, and now it's kind of like, that was kind of flat, you know, said. Um, yeah, so now it's kind of like flat line for the reset. Um, I think the technology is it is just too important, you know, so everything from, you know, how you know, the digital currencies are set up, everything from like blockchains, you know, smart contracts, um, 
you know, the combination of everything with all the different challenges. I think these yeah. things are definitely going to find its place, you know, so into the market. And I don't think it's dead. Um, but I think it did the necessary thing to do. But also, this is not the first time in history as well. But I used to have a great depression, you know, as well. And so, where all the strong stuff kind of got involved. So, a lot, a lot so I don't think it's dead, but I think it's going to be safe. So it's sort of like uh, flushed out all the greed and the opportunity and bad actors? Is that what it is? Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw that. I mean, really, I mean, but I'm not enough to know that people know what happened. Right. So, Right. Uh, this amazing series, and thank you, Amelia, for uh, hosting us, and you know, thank you, Ben Marlin. So, uh, until next time, thank you. Um, if you, um, you obviously have the, they took the, in the blockchain, they have smart contracts. If you is Russian, so lucky that the guy who played, played the um, film is from Russia. So, isn't that the only blockchain that uses smart contracts? And so if so, how is the smart contracts that's it seems like that's the state of this, this any of this or any of these any of box or AI systems to work fully by by blockchain. Where you know. Yeah, so I, I think Vitalik uh, is an immigrant at to Canada. So um, you know, that was a long, you know, just like all, all of us in virtually, you know, the whole country, I don't think anyone really remembers exactly where he came from, per se. I don't think there's any sort of real national security implications there. Um, and, you know, all these blockchains, at least most of them are decentralized anyway. You might get the figurehead. Well, we sound like it's Canadian. Ethereum is So the question is, Ethereum is the only one smart contracts. I think a lot of uh, blockchains are copied that model. So they might have like uh, they might be the well known one, but it's not a smart contract. Um, smart contract has some various blockchains. I mean including Bitcoin, you know, there's ways to add smart contracts to Bitcoin as well. It might not be native, but it is there. So I think that's a good uh